Ladies and gentlemen, consumers, and holiday shoppers of the world, the evidence in today's demonstration will show that my client, Pathfinder role-playing game, is guilty. Guilty of being the easiest fantasy role-playing game to learn today. In a role-playing game, someone needs to be the game master, a very challenging role. That person needs to describe everything that the players see in the world, needs to run the creatures, and how they react to the players as they come up with creative ideas, needs to manage a table of people. And the beginner box is the best at teaching you how to do that. I am an after-school role-playing game teacher. I run a program, I've done so since the 2012 now, where I teach 11 to 14 year olds how to play and run Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, Starfinder, and also play strategy board games. And from my own experience, I say that this is the best product for that age group. And if you know a young person who's interested in the hobby, I give this my highest recommendation. Now, some would say that D&D 5th edition should be the first RPG that one uh, runs or one learns when going into the hobby. And they would say that Pathfinder is so complicated, and I'd rebut that by saying, no, it ain't. Uh, the one can jump more easily into playing a character in 5e, yes. Uh, but the characters in Pathfinder uh, are not that much more complicated, and you'd be missing out on the very fun character customization that Pathfinder is known for. There are more rules in Pathfinder to learn, but I find that having run both systems, the rules in Pathfinder make more sense, make it easier for the GM to run the game in the long term. I made a video about that. And they there's just the learning curve. And the beginner box gets you through that learning curve. Once you've gone through it and the beginner adventure, you will have learned the rules that you need uh, to understand the game. And this book becomes a reference. Now to open this box and see what it does. It's pretty hefty, the box, as you can see. And on the top sheet, it tells you to either start with a solo adventure, or if you have a group of people who want to play the game now, to start running the group adventure. It comes with handy reference cards for the players and explains what they can do on their turn, which is quite simple compared to other fantasy games. You have three actions and one reaction. All the symbols there show you that each thing requires only one action to do. And on the back of the card, it lists the common conditions that will come up. You don't need to know them right away, but they're there. If players are using the pre-generated characters, the character sheet is very easy to follow. Orange indicates your most used stats, and every section has a yellow letter that corresponds with its explanation on the right side. Also, when you are making your own characters, the character creation guide refers to those sections. Note the spells for the spellcasters. The descriptions are not long and are quite simple. The Hero's Handbook starts with a solo adventure done in the style of choose your own adventure books. The inside front cover walks you through the character creation process. The Game Master's Guide opens with the beginner adventure and gives specific instructions on what to do in every room. And it is followed with tools for making your own adventures. It comes with color-coded dice that, as you can see, corresponds to the character sheet for people who are brand new to these games and don't know which die is which. It also comes with over 100 character and monster pawns, full color, and they are on a thick cardboard stock. It comes with a full color, double-sided map that corresponds to the beginner adventure. I'll demonstrate how easily and well the beginner box teaches the new GM how to run the game with the first two rooms in the starter adventure. And I've made changes so that this is not spoilery. And there's much more to the adventure. It's about 10 times the size. If you're wondering what I use for this demonstration, it's Foundry Virtual Tabletop, which lets you play remotely with friends. And I have a video that describes how I use it. The book begins with a very short description of what a game master is, and then starts telling you how to run your first adventure. It gives you specific directions on what to do at the table. Tell everyone to get one of the four pre-generated characters, 
and give them 10 to 15 minutes to look over them. While they're spending 10 to 15 minutes looking at their character sheets, you have time to read the first couple of pages, which go over the first room, their first encounter, and what to do in a combat. The book then describes to you the flow of play, what to do when your players enter a new room, what to read in the entry, and if they're stuck, to tell them, do you want to open the door? Do you want to search for treasure? The pre-generated characters say at the very front, choose to be a fighter if you want to be on the front lines. Choose to be a rogue if you want to sneak up to enemies to do more damage and want to have a wide variety of skills. So it's very easy for the players to pick what they want. Then it tells you to lay out the map. All the rooms correspond to a numbered entry in the book and everyone gets a character pawn and a player reference card. It then has read aloud text to introduce the adventure, which introduces the starting town of Otari, where the characters grew up, and rumors that the town's fishery is having a problem. You've received a letter from Tamily Tandravale, the owner of the fishery. Inside is a desperate plea for help. With the town guard busy protecting the loggers, she needs a few brave souls to venture down into the basement of her warehouse and put an end to the beast that's feasting on her fish. Do you have the courage to face the menace under Otari? It also suggests showing them the picture of Tamily so that they know who's asking them to take on this task. Then the players are to introduce themselves to each other, describe what their character is, and maybe describe their appearance and personality. After the players introduce themselves to each other, they then place their pawns on the stairs leading into the basement. And the GM, it suggested to tell the players, uh, maybe they want to put those with more hit points and armor class in the front. And that immediately gets them to start thinking together as a group and about what to do even before combat begins to support each other. And they probably conclude that Valoros, the fighter, should be in the front. Now, veteran game masters might think maybe it's better to play the role of Tamily Tandravale and talk to the players. Well, in my experience, many new GMs are not comfortable doing that yet, and putting them right in the basement gives them that sense of danger and consequence that makes role-playing later more engaging. Also, Tamily does not know anything about what's beneath, and so they won't really find out anything important anyway. There's some more text to read aloud. The stairs leading into the basement of the Otari fishery creak with age, between stone pillars are barrels filled with salted fish. Two have been smashed open, spilling their contents on the floor. The text then says, go around the table and ask each player the first thing they want their hero to do in the room. This is a chance for the players to interact with the environment and for you to practice responding to the players. This could be a scary moment for new GMs, but thankfully the read aloud text gave some visual description and so does the map of things that the players can explore. So the fighter player uh, moves their pawn up to the shelf and the text tells you what's on the shelves. A couple of the other players are going to be looking at the barrel of fish that's been broken into. And Kyra, the cleric here, is going to be looking at the hole in the wall. The text also tells the GM to secretly take out the pawns for the monsters that are about to attack the party. And these monsters are not what are actually in the module, so as not to spoil. And this is to get the GM ready for after the players each do their one action, the monsters attack. So there's some text to read at this point. A strange sound comes from the hole in the wall and suddenly a massive centipede several feet long emerges from the darkness and it is not alone. The centipedes rush toward you, with their huge mandibles snapping. So the GM then places the pawns onto the map and then asks all of the players to roll initiative. This read aloud text, by the way, maybe not useful for veteran GMs, is modeling, giving evocative and engaging descriptions to the players. Also note that the approach is to jump straight into the action and engage players right away. The book then describes how combat works. Everyone takes turns and rolls initiative now to see what order they will take their turn. They are referred to their character sheets to find what their perception bonus is. They roll their 20-sided die and add that bonus and report it to the GM. It then tells you to order them by from highest to lowest, the centipedes being on the same initiative count. 
The cleric is first in initiative, and her player looks at her three actions and looks at their reference card and their character sheet and looks at the various possibilities. There is a spell called Burning Hands, which lets out a gout of flame that affects a 15-foot cone, which would affect these three centipedes on the map. It does 2d6 damage, which is a, sh the book explains, is two six-sided dice of fire damage to the centipedes. She casts the spell and it takes two of her actions, so she rolls the dice. Okay, four damage, not very much. The spell also says that the centipedes make a reflex save, which means they do a defensive roll to try to avoid the damage, using their reflex saving throw bonus. The GM looks at their page and sees that these monsters have a plus six bonus to their reflex saves, so they will roll the 20-sided die and add six. The player adds that the number that the centipedes need to try to beat is 17, because that's their spell DC, or difficulty class. So the centipedes need to get 17 or higher to reduce the damage by half. The first centipede rolls its saving throw. Ah, and a 20 is a critical success. And so, according to the spell, it takes zero damage. The second centipede will now take, uh, will now make a saving throw. 10 plus its bonus of 6 is just short of what it needed, so it's going to take full damage from the spell. The third centipede will now make a save. And 20 will succeed, so it takes half damage, or 2, from the spell. Also, there is a handy checkbox so that the player knows to check it when they cast it because it no longer becomes available to them that day. Kyra has one action left and she looks at her sheet and sees that she can raise her shield. And what this does is it gives her a plus two bonus to her armor class, AC, her defensive score. Next are the centipedes and the GM is told to have one of them attack each member of the party. And this is deliberate, so that every player can get used to fighting and know what they need to know on their character sheets in combat. This centipede will attack Kyra which, with its mandibles, which get a plus six bonus. And that is 20. So it will also have a critical success. Things are not going well for the players. So it is going to roll its damage and double the damage to it. So it's d6 plus 1 damage for its mandibles. It is 7 damage, and that gets doubled to 14 damage for Kyra. Well, fortunately for Kyra, her shield was raised, and she has the option now of using her shield block reaction. She has one reaction, which lets her reduce the damage by 5, and the re what remains, the 9 damage, gets applied to her as well as to her shield. So she tracks her shield's hit points and also her own hit points, and she is now down 9 hit points. The centipede still has two actions, and so it can try to strike Kyra again. It will, when it does so though, each subsequent attack is less and less accurate, so 5 is subtracted from this next attack. So the bonus is only plus 1 now. That is going to miss, the 6 is going to miss, and Kyra's AC, by the way, is 18 right now because she has raised her shield. And it will attack one more time, but at a minus 10 penalty. So the total bonus is minus 4. So this is not going to hit either. The next centipede is going to go after Mauriciel the Rogue. So it uses one of its three actions to stride up to her and is now going to make two attacks against her. So, Mauriciel's armor class is 18, and this will miss, and the second attack will also miss. The GM then takes the third centipede and has it go after Ezrin the wizard. Ezrin has an armor class of 15 and is a little easier to hit. So, its first attack will be a 19 and do damage. It will do d6 plus 1 damage. It will do two damage to Ezrin, not bad. And it will make a second attack against Ezrin. And that will miss. 
The fourth centipede will go after Valros, who is way in the back over here. The centipede has a speed of 25 feet or five squares, so it's going to proceed up and use two actions because it has to move its speed two times in order to reach Valros, and it can make one attack against Valros. And 12 will not hit Valros. So Valros is next. Valeros wants to help his allies and not be separated from them. So he is going to try to run to this space. He has a speed of 25 feet also. He needs to take two actions to go here. However, on his character sheet, he has the ability called Sudden Charge, which lets him spend only two actions to move his speed two times and make an attack with his weapon. So he's going to attack with his longsword against this centipede. And he gets a plus nine bonus on his longsword because as a fighter, he's very accurate. He rolls 19, which does damage the centipede. And he rolls his damage, which is seven. So that is a nearly dead centipede. Valro still has an action due to his feet and he's going to make another attack, but this is, as we know, going to be less accurate. So plus four will be added to this roll. A 12 is not enough to hit the centipede, which has an armor class of 15. Next is Mauricio, and that player notes on their character sheet they have something called sneak attack. When something is flat-footed to Mauricio, then they get to do extra damage. And one way to make something flat-footed is to flank the creature. So Mauricio's going to spend her first action to move here so that she's on opposite sides uh, from Kyra. They are both on opposite sides of the target. So this means that the centipede becomes flat-footed, which on the reference cards means that they have a minus two penalty to their armor class. The centipede's armor class is reduced to 13, and she's going to attack it with her rapier, her main weapon. And a one will fail. Uh, it would be a critical failure, and that has no additional effect here. So she's going to follow it up with the weapon in her other hand, her dagger, which is an agile weapon, so it only has a minus four penalty to its accuracy after the first attack. And 21 will hit. So she's going to roll damage, and not only does she get the d4 plus 4 damage from the dagger, but she gets to add a, a six-sided die for her sneak attack bonus because she's a rogue. So she has killed the centipede which, with 8 damage. So Ezrin is next and has three actions, just like everybody else. And he's going to cast Ray of Frost, one of his cantrips, which because it's a cantrip, he can cast over and over again without limit and it can hit an enemy at range and do damage. So he is going to attack the centipede. His spell attack bonus is seven, so he's going to add seven to his attack roll. And he needs to hit a 15 here. So he does, and he does 1d4 plus his intelligence in damage. So he does five damage to the centipede. That spell costs two actions, most spells do. But Ezrin has a spell called Force Bolt, which only costs one action, which, by the way, Paizo is incorrectly printed in the character sheet. It's only one action. And he gets to cast it now. So he gets to cast two spells because it's within his three actions. So he's going to cast it on the centipede and check off the box because it uses up his focus point. So it automatically hits the centipede, and you get to do a d4 plus 1 damage to the centipede. And that is a lucky centipede. He has done 2 damage to the centipede, and the centipede is still alive. Kyra is next. Her shield bonus to AC is gone. And what she's going to do is she, is a, she can fight as well with her scimitar. Not as well as Valoros, but she can. So she's going to attack the centipede with her scimitar, which has a plus four bonus. And her 16 plus four will hit. And she's going to do damage to a d6 plus one. So she does two damage, not much, but that's enough against the centipede. Then she turns to the other centipede and uses her scimitar again, which now has 
a total of minus one. And she misses, and because her last attack will not be very accurate, she's going to use that action, her third action, to raise her shield again. So this centipede is next, and it's going to try to attack Kyra with its mandibles. So it rolls. And a 20 is another critical hit. I did not plan this. So it is going to do double damage, uh, and we will see how much this time. Okay, 14 more damage. Well, Kyra is prepared. She raised her shield and is able to withstand uh, two critical hits. However, her shield will uh, break at this time and she'll need to repair it later. Then the centipede will continue to try to attack the hapless cleric and fail. The next centipede is going to try to go after Valros. It's gonna follow this path. However, Valros has his own reaction on his sheet called Attack of Opportunity. As a fighter, he is so trained that when a m monster leaves a square that he threatens, he gets to make an attack against it as a reaction. So he will do this during another creature's turn. So he attacks with his longsword. And 27 will be a critical hit and he is definitely going to kill this centipede with 24 damage. All right, so that was a critical hit because it was 10 higher, 10 or more higher than the centipede's armor class, which is another way to get a critical hit in this game. Next is Valeros, who's going to move here and try to deliver the last blow. He's going to attack the centipede, and the 19 will hit. It has one health, so that will be a dead centipede. So after the battle, the book says that they are no longer taking turns, and the GM is told to ask the players to go around the table uh, and ask them what they want to do. So by going around the table, that does, that's one way to prevent uh, players not saying anything. and. Uh, Ezrin will uh, do spend 10 minutes to get his focus point back. Meanwhile, Kyra will spend one of her three heal spells and try to get her health back and heal herself d8 plus 8. So she's going to give herself 10 health back. The book says that if the party decides to go back upstairs to talk to Tamily and tell them what's happened, she's going to ask them to go back downstairs because those fish were not taken by centipedes. The barrel was not broken into by centipedes. And that there's something else. So that's useful advice for the GM. So the party ventures down this path to see what is down there. And the book gives text to read out. Squeezing through the hole, you find yourself in a cavern that seems to stretch endlessly beneath the streets of Otari. Who knows what menace could be lurking down here? Up ahead, the passageway ends in a cliff that plunges sharply into the darkness. So they find themselves with a needing to use their skills at this point with the steep cliff. This makes clear that you how to use your stats outside of combat. And the, the book says that they can use their athletics skill to climb down this slippery cliff. And that the number that they need to roll is 15. So the players start looking at their sheets and seeing their bonuses and they start to do their rolls. Now the page now demonstrates the four degrees of success, what happens when they critically succeed, when they succeed, when they fail, and when they critically fail. So everything from climbing all the way down in one check or falling and taking damage from the fall. And furthermore, the players might come up with the idea of using some of their equipment. They have ropes. And so they might use that to tie it to something stable uh, and use the rope to climb down. And the book gives guidance on that. Instead of a 15 that they need, they only need 10 to climb down. Also, they can assist each other. So they can roll a die and give each other a plus one uh, on their check or a plus two if they critically succeed to help someone who's less capable. So this shows the party how they can use skills, how they can help each other, and how they can use their uh, ingenuity to solve problems to affect uh, these number rolls. Once they get to the bottom of the cliff, they can explore this area. The book 
says what they find if they search carefully. And the book also notes that if they venture farther into this complex, they're going to need light because it's dark up ahead. So as you can see, the, the book is gradually introducing new things at a steady pace while through an actual adventure. So just from this demonstration, you can see how both the GM and the players are learning the basic structures of combat, what to do in a round, what to do outside of combat, and the players are learning the basics of checks, of adding bonuses, how to find their most important stats on their character sheet. And with this same demonstrative approach, the book goes through other things, having the players use other skills of theirs, having more monsters that have more interesting abilities, such as being resistant to certain kinds of damage or having weaknesses, having the players use their knowledge skills to try to find out those weaknesses, using snares to stymie the party, uh, enemies that have ranged attacks. Also, there's advice on making the denizens of the dungeons respond to the sound that the players the characters make in the dungeon. There's also examples of strange, mysterious locations like altars or statues, for instance, and using their knowledge skills for that. Simple puzzles. There's also traps and even a complex trap that has its own turn in, in initiative. There are monsters that you can talk to. There are locked doors using your skills for locked doors and for traps using the environment to your advantage in the mid middle of a battle is also taught and then the players get to have their first experience of leveling up to level two and end with an appropriately climactic moment so back to learning of the game once you go through this beginning adventure they uh, can go through the rules in the hero's handbook and they are not it's not huge. It's about 10 pages in this book, and it's a very attractive uh, book. And maybe about 40% of that's going to be new after they've already gone through the beginner adventure with the GM. And then for if they want to get into a little more um, of what they can do, they can go through the skills section, uh, which is eight more pages, for things like how to use your athletics to trip people or grap grapple people in battle. There's also a quick reference guide at the back of each book with all the most common and used rules. And again, once you've done all that, you basically have what you need to treat this book as a reference and the other books so that you can make characters in Pathfinder. The, there's a lot of value in the beginner box. Again, the adventure takes 12 to 15 hours from the playthroughs I've seen on YouTube. And then there's a lot to work with for the Game Master after this first dungeon. There are charts for making your own encounters, uh, seeding treasure. There are dozens of monsters, dozens of magic items. There's also a detailed starting town that the characters can live in and use as an adventuring base, and a list of quest ideas. The Hero's Handbook has what you need to make characters using the four classes that are included in the pre-generated characters using the three ancestries dwarf elf and human and <clears throat> for pathfinder that is a small slice of those options that are available to you but that's necessary to have something manageable for new players but <clears throat> not a problem if you want to branch out even for your first adventure you might want to make characters for using the full options, which are all free online at Archives of Nethys, and I'll put a link in the description. Now, where to move on from the beginner box? The box includes a very handy sheet of the next books, the most essential books that you would want if you want to get nice physical books. There's also a module called Troubles in Otari, which starts at level two, so it can be used right after the beginner box adventure, and takes characters up to level four. And it continues with the same teaching approach of teaching the GM and the players as they encounter different things. There's also a more sandboxy adventure outside of a dungeon, which is a nice change of pace and introduces the GM to other kinds of adventures. Uh, there's also the Abomination Vaults, which is a well-regarded adventure path. Adventure paths are longer quests 
that are released by Paizo, the makers of Pathfinder, that goes from level 1 to level 10, set in the same starting town. So that's my case for the Pathfinder Beginner Box as the best product for learning a fantasy tabletop role-playing game today. It's, as you can see, it's kind of ideal for a younger age group, but actually I recommend it for everybody of every age who wants to learn Pathfinder because it is very approachable and it's, it teaches, it's designed to teach. What the beginner box does really well is that it emphasizes that this is a game and that you don't need to read pages of rules unless you want to before you start playing. And it's okay to get a rule wrong here or there or to not know about something, so long as the table's having fun. And once you go through the, even just the first couple of rooms, the players get a framework of how the game works and how to understand their character sheet and can tackle the rest of Pathfinder. So if you haven't yet, like and subscribe to my channel. I am the Rules Lawyer. I am a lawyer who teaches and runs tabletop role-playing games with kids and teens. And thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.